working then. All right, we are recording. Uh, so as always, our antitrust policy notice. Uh, we do have a new slide that we're inserting in here. Um, as Dan would normally say, we do welcome everybody to uh, join us in the community. Uh, we do have a code of conduct that you should follow, uh, basically stating, you know, don't be a jerk. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so this is our agenda for today. Um, so we'll I'm offended there is not a French version. I'm sorry. This is not oh, inclusive. <laughs> How many, how many uh, different languages can you fit on one slide? <laughs> I don't. I know. You just got an <laughs> AR. <laughs> Make one. Pull out it. <laughs> All right. Um, so event reminders. Um, obviously, the APAC Hack Fest coming the week of March 4th. Uh, we're finalizing on the, the uh, venue uh, with the Hyperledger Global Forum is coming up in uh, just about two weeks, uh, just under, and uh, that's in Basel, Switzerland. If you haven't registered yet, uh, please consider doing so. And then the last uh, reminder here is just that uh, the Linux Foundation IT is going to have limited support at the end of the year uh, due to the holidays. Uh, so December 17th through the January through January 2nd, uh, you'll have you'll see limited support. So I just got a note from Dan. He's at the hospital with uh, someone. So uh, I'm guessing he will not join us. Um, okay. He did say he sent a note to Kelly, Brian, and Tracy. Oh, well, I haven't checked my email. If your email, point. you might want to check your email. <laughs> okay. Um, Make sure that know. explains it. Tracy? Yes. Um, also, it's not just the IT group that's off, right? You, the, most of the staff will be off at that time? Uh, that's true. That is so true we enough. shouldn't expect immediate responses. Well, we never stuff may take a while it may take a little bit longer yep yep that's true mark thanks for that all right uh so the first thing that then we have on our agenda is the hyperledger borough quarterly project update um silas do you want to take us through that yes hello everyone hey silas um so uh, yeah, I'll dump it in the TSC mailing list. I know it's on the uh, calendar invite as well. Um, so there's the update. There's also some attached. Uh, I usually I usually try and do a roadmap for the next quarter and uh, a post mortem of my last roadmap. Although uh, <laughs> uh, basically everything off the last roadmap got kind of abandoned. Um, so hey, never mind. Um, so project health. Um, yeah, <clears throat> um, I don't know whether no news is good news. Um, in some ways it is, in some ways not. It, it's largely the same as the previous update. So um, we've added quite a lot of features, particularly around governance. Um, and we're now in a state with what we're doing with Borough, when I say we, Monax, um, that we need to uh, not throw away users' data um, and operate without us having quorum. So we have a proposal mechanism which allows you to vote on an atomic batch of transactions to upgrade smart contracts. We have a governance TX that allows us to change different types of network parameters. We're working on a, a fork TX, which says if you dump this version of this chain at this height, restore it in a new version of Burrow, um, you should get this app hash. So it's a somewhat principled way of making breaking changes where you need to throw away blocks or at least archive them to an old chain. So, that's a kind of general, uh, general focus of, of the work that we're doing. Uh, a bunch of sort of fixes and hardening. We found that there are various types of EVM errors that are getting swallowed. Um, and there's some reworking around that. But the big thing would be um, uh, the governance proposal mechanism. Uh, in terms of the project itself, we are still rather lacking in maintainer diversity. Um, although there is, uh, in particular, one individual who I'm Although I have been here before in saying that I very much hope to add as a maintainer, um, uh, hopefully this one will, will follow through and he'll be joining us in Basel actually. Um, uh, <laughs> we seem to have a steady theme of in interest. It hasn't gone up or down really. Um, several messages a day on the, the chat and um, mailing lists are quiet, but that's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. I don't put a lot there, um, although I am planning to announce uh, uh, the next sort of major patch release we, we do because I wanted to just add some docs to 
the proposal mechanism before I got onto that. Uh, in terms of issues, <coughs> um, this is again similar to last quarter's. Um, the, the, the biggest area we could do with, with, with help on it is is documenting our tooling and general documentation. So how you get started. I've added a couple of example apps on our Burrow JS, uh, which is our uh, JavaScript library uh, for talking to Burrow, which um, currently lives in a in a repo that outside of Hyperledger because it relies on GPL code. However, we are in the process of changing that. We found a MIT licensed uh, ABI decoder, which looks like a fairly simple switch. So hopefully we're pulling that into the, I think into the Burrow repo. Um, uh, David Boswell has put me in contact with a potential technical ambassador uh, to mentor on Burrow who might be able to help with documentation, um, although uh, he has gone quiet since last email. Um, but yeah, if we can get anyone to help us on that, that would be great. Uh, releases, the release cadence um, is good, uh, as it was uh, having been bad. Um, before the last quarter, <coughs> we made three releases, one of the major, um, uh, including the proposal mechanism, the improved error, error handling that I've mentioned, and the EVM stuff, um, <laughs> as well as upgrading uh, Tenement. Uh, so one of the things that we're working towards is, is Tenement hitting 1.0, which may happen uh, around March time, uh, which is really the trigger for us to try and start thinking about moving to 1.0 status ourselves. Um, uh, we've uh, built quite a useful thing called Vent. Again, this lives in, we have a single satellite repo called Bosmarmot that contains Burrow.js and Vent uh, and a couple of other examples. Um, and again, I, I, I'm planning to deprecate this, particularly if we can get Burrow.js uh, out of GPL and pull it all into Burrow, um, kind of mono repo for the win. Um, Vent is a service that listens to Solidity EVM events um, and based on some declarative specifications you give it, it will build a kind of event sourced uh, table structure. So it's a, it's a query side scaling. We use it with Postgres. It supports a SQLite backend as well. One of these standard things you often build with blockchain applications. So um, in combination with some stuff we overhauled before around our event and block storage, uh, we now have this kind of uh, block and transaction execution structure that gives a complete history of transactions. And from that, we, we build um, SQL tables. Um, <clears throat> a bit like with something like Kafka, it remembers the height as an offset. And if it dies, uh, it will always uh, recover uh, because it writes atomically when, it's, uh, when it updates a table, it, it, it writes the offset there. So um, it, it's quite nice for building uh, event pipey things and that's what we're using it for. But it'd be nice to uh, see it get a bit more use. It's quite a nice uh, thing built from the, the ground up. Um, also, in terms of the way the specifications work and how they interact with the uh, Solidity data, spec uh, data formats, uh, it, it might be interesting to see whether we could adapt it for use in both Fabric EVM and Sawtooth CES. Um, uh, so that's just something to flag. Um, <coughs> mailing list, uh, yeah, quiet, chat, active, already said that. Um, Current plans, you can see the borough roadmap, which is linked there. Um, and we're looking, as I say, about this, this 40X mechanism, which we think we can use for doing a bunch of interesting things, including upgrades and um, kind of a state channel type use cases where you uh, fork to a smaller borough with a few fewer validators. Um, we're also looking ahead, and I think relating to some of the conversations on the TSC, I'd like to mount a, um, a WASM engine within borough. Um, and one of our team has got a kind of proof of concept using uh, LLVM and Antler to write a Solidity grammar, something that rather surprisingly doesn't exist. Solidity is all hand-rolled. Uh, and he's managed to get a basic contract compiling to WASM. Um, so I find this is a potentially interesting migration case that we have a whole process engine written in, um, in Solidity, more on that in a second. Um, and migrating some of the functions over to WASM would be good in itself, but also, if WASM and WASM related standards are something that uh, uh, Hyperledger frameworks can maybe uh, atomize around, then that's kind of an interesting direction for, for Burrow too. Um, in a slight side news, <coughs> although I think it relates to Burrow, we've been building this business process on a blockchain functionality in a project called Blackstone, which is linked there, um, which is this mostly a Solidity implementation of business process modeling, um, but also has a Node.js API for uh, kind of a builder, a, a builder API for building up these graphs. 
and we're, we're working with Spiro to kind of give it this process focus by giving it some native uh, like process graph traversal and process related S natives. Um, and one thing I just like to put out there and uh, I know that the stuff around the, uh, the supply chain, which is, is kind of um, toolkit framework type things is a new direction. We would be interested uh, in, in potentially in Hyperledger if, uh, hosting the Blackstone project. Um, off the bat, it, 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 it would be compatible with, um, uh, well, it ought to be fairly easy to make compatible with, with Ceph and um, Fabric EVM. Um, maintain a diversity. Uh, so yeah, a lot of Monax. We've got a new person in Monax who um, has, has been added as a maintainer. Um, a very good co contributor who came out of nowhere is a guy called Pierrick uh, Himbert, who's coming to Basel, uh, the largesse of Hyperledger, for which I'm very grateful, or well, 75% largesse. Um, so he's introduced some nice stuff, including like some uh, RFC type, uh, we're calling it VIP, although that does clash with Bitcoin Improvement Program. Um, and he's done uh, a bunch of code changes and uh, has been great to work with so far. So uh, I, I think if he's able to keep up um, uh, contributing, uh, I'd very much like to make him a maintainer, which would be a, a non-Monax maintainer. He's in, um, he works for a type of FinTech company, um, but a lot of the work he's doing uh, extraneous to that. Um, and we've had some useful uh, issue suggestions from uh, Kenneth uh, Kosky of Sawtooth. Um, and a few other documentation stuff, but a little quiet on the contributors, but they, they, they do appear. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that pretty much covers it. Questions? Go for um, it, Two things. One is I, I just met with, uh, two weeks ago with um, Jan from Monax. He showed me the BPM engine. Uh, and he showed me also the uh, how it works with the agreements network. So does your BPM, I mean, your BPM engine, I assume is similar or the same as the one in Monax because you guys are, I mean, Monax is <laughs> open sourced everything, right? So that's the we first both. question. <clears throat> Yeah, so I mean, we've open sourced almost everything. The the the, the BPM engine is implemented uh, fundamentally in Solidity, and that's open sourced in Black in Blackstone, um, and um, as is the API. Um, the the Monax platform stuff you might have seen is is our version, our Monax flavored UI layer, primarily UI layer on top of that. Um, but the but Blackstone is is meant to be general purpose um, business process modeling in the Solidity context. And like I say, uh, we want to look into having some process supporting features in Burrow because a lot of this stuff is not ideal running in pure solidity. Um, and that's where things like WASM and our existing S native functionality become interesting. But yeah, uh, there are no two, two implementations. What you saw under the hood was, was Blackstone. Yeah, I didn't have enough time to go into depth on that, but uh, Jan did say that I should come back to the offices, uh, on I guess, to the uh, to the Monax offices, to look more at it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, ask for your help is uh, in the identity working uh, group. We are preparing a paper about identity in uh, different DLTs under Hyperledger. Of course, that includes Burrow, and we have very little material on it. I was poking around your documentation to see whether I could uh, create a 200 or 300 word output about identity from uh, what you already have. If you do not have that uh, readily accessible, any pointers would be helpful. Once we write that 200, 300 uh, word of exp uh, you know, explanation of identity in Burrow, we'll send it back to your guys to get feedback on it. That's the first thing. And uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, technical uh, ambassador help, I'll be, I'll be in uh, Basel too, and I 
want to get a little bit beefed up on borough so that I can help people with borough. I, I know quite a bit about fabric uh, and about sawtooth, uh, maybe a little lesser amount, but uh, you know, I want to in improve my knowledge of borough. Thank you. And I mean, that, that would be great. I think that uh, borough, particularly uh, as various things have been combined, is, is in a good position to have documentation explainers added to the repo. In terms of identity, uh, at the keys level, um, keys slash contract identity, uh, there's some stuff that would be relevant to borrow. Identity writ large is a harder thing. We do have some, uh, in, the, in the smart contracts that we use in Blackstone, we do have some ideas around user proxies and, and, and how we model stuff out, but uh, um, not, not hugely broadly. I, I was gonna stick around for the indie call after this actually to talk about some related issues and it, uh, wallet stuff, but yeah, let, let's um, let, let's chat at, uh, at Basil Vipin, and um, I, I can give you a tour of what we've got and, what, and where we're going. Yeah, yeah, Ian did mention MetaMask. Uh, I didn't, I, I did not, I know whether it was a generic, uh, you know, Ethereum uh, product or whether, I mean, how how it would be um, changed to adapt to Burrow. Yeah. Um, so. It's, it's a little difficult to get it working directly because it requires uh, a, a method on the Web3 interface, which, by the way, Burrow doesn't have at all. Uh, Seth has and Fabric are moving along on that. Neither of them have the uh, uh, send raw transaction method, which you need from MetaMask in its default operation, which involves using the uh, encoding and, and, and signature scheme of public Ethereum. However, I think what can, what can happen is uh, at the JavaScript level, a Web3 provider, uh, a kind of shim can be written that would allow its use. Um, now, I know there was some, some Web3 provider stuff going on in the context of Truffle on Ceph. Um, uh, on Burrow, really being led by a lot by Agreements Network and Monax's needs, we've, we've been, um, been working with our own gRPC interfaces and stuff. So. Uh, at some point, I think it, it's very useful to have something like MetaMask. So ultimately, this allows you to control some private keys in your browser, sign and send transactions locally. So you, you can do that with Burrow, but but you don't get the the web uh, the Ethereum uh, tooling. Thank you. So uh, we don't need to do it on this call, but I definitely like to hear more about Blackstone. Uh, I think one thing the whole community could use is projects that span the different um, frameworks that we have. So to help pull things together a little bit across, across the community um, versus separate silos. So I think that would be great. Yeah, well, let me, let me post it in the TSC. I wanted to kind of plant the seed there, not the rail this too much as an update. And obviously if we, if we went through with this, we'd, we'd be looking at a proposal either in labs or somewhere else. Um, uh, but, but a couple of things occurred to me on that is exactly as you say, yes, there is there's, there's de definitely potential for this to um, generalize across uh, at least the, the EVM transaction processor and, and, and um, chain code. Uh, the other area where I think this would be an interesting inaugural project now that um, EEA is a, 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 a co-member or, or what, whatever the exact relationship is, uh, you know, given that this is a process engine written in Solidity uh, in the to large degree could be run on uh, public Ethereum at vast cost. Um, but uh, it, it, it does sit, seem to sit at an inter interesting intersection. So it would be potential for an inaugural kind of collaboration with EEA members, perhaps. Sounds great. So Silas, in your update, you uh, alluded to possibly considering a, a Wendetto uh, sometime uh, in the near future. I, I think, you know, obviously some of the challenges that exist there are around the maintainer diversity uh, and that sort of thing, right? I think we should probably try and figure out how to increase diversity of the maintainership um, and contributors just so um, you know, that hurdle is, is um, addressed before you reach that point. Yeah, um, 
past March kind of feels like the far future. Uh, <laughs> that that would be when Tendermint was 1.0. But yeah, no, I, I understand that that the, the, the maintainer and contributor diversity needs to come up. Um, again, actually, something like Blackstone, if we could drive a bit of interest in that, we, we I think think the issue is being with Burrow is that. <clears throat> um, we're kind of just weird enough with respect to normal Ethereum that we get interest from uh, Solidity people, but part of it is not really communicating some of the features and the sort of way that Burrow works effectively enough. Um, and, and some of it is not having uh, implementation for things like Web3, whereas uh, our, our, our fellow projects, uh, Cess and, and Fabric EVM, have had a bit more muscle and a bit more... Uh, interesting directly appealing to public ethereum people and have built out some of that stuff so it wouldn't be hard to build some uh, some similar public ethereum facing stuff um uh but yes uh open to any suggestions for that okay maybe we can uh spend some time offline kind of thinking through some some things that we can do yeah cool in, in, in basel um yeah great Sounds good. All right, any other questions for Silas before we move on? Okay, so the next thing that we have then is the Hyperledger Cello update. Um, who's going to be doing that one? How do you say I will make the report? Okay, great. Okay, I just uh, posted the uh, report link to the Rocket Chat channel and uh, feel free to open the page there. Um, overall, the project just going as a plan and uh, uh, the healthy is uh, good. Uh, in the past quarter, we made uh, the release uh, 0 0.9 as planned and uh, mostly the uh, discussions happened at uh, the Rocket channel and also the WeChat group. And uh, also we have uh, questions and uh, our sounds uh, at uh, the mail list. And uh, our uh, regular week weekly call, it, uh, go, uh, it's going uh, every week. And uh, usually there are uh, almost uh, 10 persons present there. And uh, from uh, both uh, the Asia and North America area, and uh, um, majorly the uh, pet set uh, get uh, active reviewed and uh, a response within two days. Uh, we have a good signal um, in the past uh, quarter that more and more user keys are related to Cello. Um, in the Montreal Hackfest, one of our maintainer, uh, Tom, present cello there and also have collect the feedbacks. Uh, we reviewed the uh, 10 plus suggestions one by one. And uh, we think uh, uh, some of them are uh, very helpful and uh, we put into the roadmap. Uh, and we also um, uh, propose a new uh, design spec related to the new uh, architecture uh, for Cello. Uh, one of the uh, uh, major purposes is to enhance uh, the support of uh, uh, the consortium governing model. And uh, for the next quarter, we plan to release the 1.0 uh, there. And uh, about the diversity, um, um, currently, uh, the cello's diversity has become the stable. Uh, we have no new uh, maintainers uh, come out in the uh, past quarter. And uh, we hopefully can have uh, new maintainers in uh, next quarter. And uh, the major issue is still related to the contributor uh, diversity. Uh, currently, most of the contributors are still from uh, uh, like uh, China and uh, uh, U uh, United States uh, and uh, also India. And we hopefully can uh, find more contributors, especially the code uh, developers uh, appear from uh, other countries. 
and and uh, also uh, in order to resolve the issue, uh, we do have plans like to promote Cello more um, in the uh, locally uh, meetups, and also for the global forum, I plan to attend that and uh, help promote uh, Cello there. Um, that's majorly the summary of the quarterly uh, report of Cello. Uh, we are open to any questions and uh, suggestions. Thanks. Any plans to uh, support other DLTs other than Fabric? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, it's also one of the questions that appear at the, the Montreal Hackfest. Uh, we do uh, discuss this uh, at the meeting. Um, but uh, the conclusion now is that uh, since we do not have uh, enough um, developers that are familiar with other DLT technologies, we may uh, first focus on the fabric and uh, make sure the 1.0 release come out. Does Sawtooth, uh, Iroha, Burrow, um, Quilt have similar orchestration uh, uh, deployment and orchestration products? I mean, I, I know that I'm asking you that question, but anybody else who knows about this could talk about it and then see how they could all uh, merge uh, some of those uh, functionalities or code into cello and suggest architectural changes to make that happen. Yeah, that's a really nice uh, suggestion. And uh, I will uh, highly encourage um, the person from other project to help review our new architecture uh, spec is to support the new uh, consortium governing model. So if you think that cannot match your uh, own project, please let us know. Feel free to leave the comments there. Hey, wh where is this document? Well, let me post the link into the rocket chat. It's in the weekly report, uh, in the quarterly report, actually. It's there in the rocket chat channel now. Thanks. Okay, other questions for um, Bella? Okay, um, just from the, the Hyperledger side, um, we should talk about the, the 1.0 release and kind of the sorts of things that we think about um, as we uh, want to move towards that. And obviously there's the um, process that we have now for any projects that want to go to 1.0. Uh, I guess this goes to both Silas and, and Bow Wow about um, getting the TSC approval before doing uh, doing that or approaching that. So um, those are some other things to think about, but uh, definitely I'll, I'll reach out and um, we can talk about that further. Yeah, thanks Tracy. Yep, no problem. Uh, so, uh, as far as other quarterly updates, next week we expect the Hyperledger Explorer, and then uh, we are over a month since uh, the Hyperledger Composer update was due to the TSC. Um, so those are the two that we have coming up next week. All right, uh, no quarterly updates uh, this week. Uh, from the working groups because we have done all of those for this quarter. So we will expect to start those up again in January. Uh, then we have some open discussion items. Um, the, the first one there that we have is, is probably the biggest one that we have. It's the project versus sub-project discussion that has been spawned from the Fabric desktop proposal um, that went out uh, a few weeks back. So there was obviously this question of, uh, you know, should this be a sub-project of Fabric or should it be a, a full-blown project? And, uh, you know, we've actually had some discussions uh, in the past about kind of what is the scope of, of things that should be coming in as 
uh, full bloom projects versus uh, something that is a sub project of our existing project. So um, we can start that discussion. Obviously, I doubt we'll finish it today. Um, maybe before we get there, though, I just want to maybe touch on the other two, which might be a little shorter. Um, so the community survey one, uh, just, just, this is just FYI. I sent out an email this week that was a summary of, of what we discovered in our last community survey that we did last year about this time. And we're looking to kick off uh, another version of that to see kind of what's changed uh, since we did our initial survey. So we're looking for feedback on any additional questions that people in the community, uh, the TSC specifically, feel are um, useful to uh, gather as we look. So um, definitely have a look at that email and, and that uh, uh, Google Doc and add your comments and feedback there. And then Arno, did you want to talk quickly about the roles and responsibilities for lab sponsors? I think that might be shorter than our project versus subproject discussion. Yes, I guess uh, I would be happy to talk about it. I don't know if it's shorter, but <laughs> it seems Depends like those issues who's. seem to excite people and everybody jumps in very quickly. Everybody has an opinion. So. <laughs> we do not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, otherwise you could listen to yourself if you didn't want people's opinion. <laughs> no, no, anyway, no. <laughs> Arnold, uh, go ahead. So, so I mean, th there are really two issues that are somewhat related, and it, you know, it had to do with the the role of the the lab sponsors, and um, you know, when we put the the labs together. We had discussions. One of the fears, right, was well, if we make it too easy, anybody can just come and dump whatever projects. It's not going to be very good for the the hyperledger overall. And so we were discussing different ways of mitigating the risk of you know the labs becoming a dumping ground for everything and anything. And so. I honestly don't remember the exact details on how this came up, but we came up with this notion of requiring some sponsor and we define what a sponsor, you know, who could qualify as a sponsor. And I think we went through a few iterations, but eventually we settled on something like the TSC members, a working group chair, somebody like this, who has already some role within Hyperledger and can back up the, the, the lab proposal. And we left it at this. And so the documentation today says, when you put a proposal together, you must have a sponsor. And it doesn't really say what is expected of the sponsor. And so the question came up, you know, in the context of somebody trying to set up a, a lab and somebody trying to figure out, can I volunteer to be a lab a sponsor? I would like to know what my responsibilities are. And so, you know, as I was indicating in an email, yesterday uh, you know some of us the lab stewards basically had uh, some kind of discussion and you know we 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 were trying to figure out what is the right thing to do and you know in kind of brainstorming several ideas we came up but my concern was you know if we put too much burden on people to have to be a sponsor we're going to first limit how many people you know will be willing to be sponsors and that will eventually limit the number of labs which i don't think was the intent initially so i'm f in favor of trying to define what a sponsor is in a very limited way and of course there are some ideas that were brought up as being a mentor for the project on an ongoing basis maybe reporting to the tsc every now and then all of that I think should be left to the discretion of the mentors. But, and so, you know, it does, and I'm happy to separate those two questions, but, you know, there was a separate issue that I raised earlier that came up in the context of, you know, a different lab proposal where, you know, uh, Dev Husby was, you know, asking if he could be the sponsor, and I thought he should be able to, but, so I had suggested we extend the list of possible sponsors to include the staff. Then 
took issue to this. Several people expressed uh, support at the time and Dan took issue saying, no, I think it should be somebody more technical. And, you know, we never had a chance to discuss it further. So, but there is a combined, there, there is a connection there because the shorter the list of possible sponsors, the worse it gets, you know, as we put more, uh, as we, you know, the, the responsibility we put on the sponsors increases. So we have to be careful. I think, you know, I'd be, I would be more comfortable asking more from the sponsors if the list of possible sponsors was bigger, but it's pretty small right now. And so I don't, if, fundamentally, I don't want to limit the number of labs just because we don't have enough sponsors we're willing to do to, to sponsor the labs. That's really what it comes down to. Okay, the second question I think should be deferred because Dan was the person who uh, yeah. expressed. Uh, uh, I agree. Uh, uh, so he is not here due to an emergency. So I don't think we should even take it up. Um, second thing about the me uh, mentorship and about uh, you know who's uh, what are the duties of a sponsor? I mean, let's let's be very clear. Um, in open source communities, there are no real duties. Nobody's held accountable uh, anyway. People volunteer all the time to write sections of the paper and they never show up. Uh, so what do I yeah. do? Uh, so this is a list of suggestions on what a sponsor can do to uh, make a, a lab uh, healthy, right? So of course, the initial thing is that the lab should make sense to the sponsor. Uh, otherwise, why should the sponsor agree to put their name on it? But even that cannot be really insisted on because unless somebody questions the sponsor, have they read the pro uh, actual proposal? One never knows. Um, so to be a responsible sponsor, you have to at least read the uh, proposal and to agree to it. That's the first thing. Second is, maybe help them write the proposal in the right way uh, because the sponsor is presumably already aware of this. So it's all got to do with onboarding the lab. A sponsor saying, yes, I'm standing behind this project. The other part, which was basically be a mentor, you know, that's an open thing, right? Meaning be a mentor is such a open statement that it can be like somebody asking once in a while, how's the lab going to somebody saying, you know, we haven't seen any activity in the lab for this many, what are your blocking points? Can we put in touch with others and so on and so forth. But I don't think the intention was to have all these as requirements or no. So these are not like, you know, these are some suggestions. So- No, 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 but okay. And, and that uh, might be uh, fine. And so, that's that's I mean, what we need to decide as a you know. So that's that I that's said. where I would put my support, which is as a lab steward and as a potential sponsor. This is what I uh, I would say, you know, at least be um, aware of what the proposal is and what are the potentials before you put well, your name. Well, I totally agree with that because if they don't do that, then I don't know what else. They do and what it means at all to other sponsors. So I agree completely with this. I think that's not uh, in question. So that's why my proposal was to say, yeah, this at least is part, you know, is the main responsibility of the sponsor. I don't have a prime listing other, you know, tasks they might take on as, as optional, you know. I think it makes sense for the sponsor to have some involvement, not just to be a rubber stamp. Um, so it may be good to have, you know, here's the minimum set of requirements and here's some other suggestions. Um, the sponsor should be able to come into the TSC and, and you know, at least for the proposal, you know, help write it and, and come in and be the one who presents it. Um, to show that they, they do have some knowledge of it and can answer questions. And maybe if we're doing any kind of updates to the TSC, then um, you know the sponsor would be involved in that as well. With you know, there could be technical backup, but but no Mark, uh, 
currently the labs do not require a reporting back to the TSC or in any way connecting to the TSC, uh, at least formally. Well, and, yeah. and the other thing that seems interesting here is I, we would like to say that the lab is being run by whoever the actual maintainers of that code are. And the sponsor is really more of a facilitator for kind of bringing it in, not the, the primary contributor necessarily. They're, they're really more vouching for this is something that should be, you know, pursued under the Hyperledger umbrella, not necessarily something they, they themselves are pursuing. It, it does seem fair that they would be able to help answer questions or, or at least help the code maintainer answer whatever questions that folks have of them, especially the labs um, maintainers. Um, but I don't know that we should encourage them to take the primary responsibility. It seems better that we're using labs to onboard new maintainers of new projects um, rather than having the maintainer or the sponsors take over that kind of primary communications role. That's right. Otherwise, we're falling back to something that becomes very close to the, what we currently have with the main projects. And then uh, we, I think we kind of lose sight of what the whole point of having labs was in the first place, which is to have, you know, a very loose way of allowing, you know, communities to work on projects together and within the umbrella of the uh, Hyperledger. With that, the whole, you know, governance of, of you know, full-blown projects. Um, I was just looking around the, the, the original proposal, uh, the original uh, labs uh, blog post and, and some of the other uh, proposal wiki stuff. So I, I think I agree with Arnold that the, that we don't want to have a dumping ground and then the other tension is we don't want to raise the bar too much to get a sponsor. Uh, I'm wondering whether what might be missing is uh, if we want to make it relatively easy to launch a labs project, then that's fine. But do we, do we leak uh, labs projects? Like there doesn't seem to be a way that they get cleared up by our inactivity. Um, <clears throat> with, with normal projects, there's the status uh, kind of spec that describes the process towards end of life. But if, if we're satisfied that we can avoid uh, a dumping ground by cleanup, then maybe we don't have to worry so much about sponsor requirements. So yeah, so that's that. a good point. And the labs reported, I mean, the lab stewards reported before, and we are just talking about having another report, putting a report together for the TSE. So we do have this kind of overall, uh, you know, uh, monitoring made by the the labs. And I have to, I have to salute Tracy, who is really on the forefront doing most of the work. Right. Yeah, and I was going to say, I think in our original charter, we did have a, if something has gone inactive for, I think it was six months, then we do archive it, right? Um, obviously, after having a conversation to find out what's happening, but um, I think there is an archive mechanism. We've created an archive um, directory already, um, yes. but I don't think we've been out there for six months yet, right? Because we've only done the one quarterly report and we're talking about the second one now so i think with the second report we can see if anything is inactive right and and then have start to have those discussions around um should we be archiving this particular lab what do we post the typical metrics that we're using for that is it complete inactivity for six months or and are we doing any type of regular check-in with the people to see what's going on with them as to why it hasn't occurred uh, we don't do regular check-ins with our labs, Solana. Uh, and I believe yeah. if and I remember... That was, that was yeah. intentional because we didn't want the overhead. Exactly, more. exactly. Okay. Um, and so, I think that we had... Um, I think we were only looking by commits to answer your other questions, Solana. Only commits. Okay, all right. Thank you. So why are we even talking about archiving if we don't have additional overhead uh, on this uh, then, you know, if the project is um, silent for a while, it could very well be revived later. And if we are not spending any cycles on it, uh, either in time or anything else, uh, then why are we talking about archiving and all this other stuff around archiving? Because currently uh, the labs were an area to have very little governance except for the presence of the sponsor to say, yes, the lab is good to go. Yeah, I know, I know the reason why we, we use it is it gives us 
a way of being covered by the um, hyperledger development agreements that we have, right? So it covers intellectual property and all the rest of the stuff. And it gives us a way of doing collaborative development for um, kind of speculative work. That's that's its value to us. Um, and it's been perfect for that. Um, whether or not a real project comes out of it is a separate issue. But um, what, what what is, do we have, at, and I've looked for this a couple of times, do we have a list, like a wiki page that's just a list of projects? Because the only, the only other way that I would say, you know, there's a difference between archival is that, you know, there's a list of, these are the ones that have commits in the last six months, and these are the ones that don't have commits in the last six months. Have fun. So long, GitHub. But there's nothing, there's no references to the list in the wiki, right? I, I don't I, think so. I, I couldn't find it, but. No. That doesn't it is. You go to the GitHub lab space and you find what's there. And that's the only thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the other thing I wanted to point out, you know, we don't really have a problem we're trying to solve here. The only problem, you know, if anything, is there is absolutely zero definition today of what a sponsor is, and it does raise, you know, it has led somebody to say, oh, can I volunteer to be a lab sponsor? What am I volunteering to? <laughs> Which is a fair question, right? But so I, I don't think we should go crazy on trying to put this under heavy control of any form because today we don't have a problem of like too many labs and too, you know, too many labs not functioning, being dormant or whatever. And so it's always time to increase control if we need to, but uh, I'm happy to try to be, you know, lenient in and say, no, let's keep it simple. Uh, right now, we have had people who have volunteered to be sponsors. I don't know what their expectation was. I did. I just did one, and and you know, I've helped these people, and you know, I did some of what's listed there. But primarily, I was like, okay, I had the discussion with these guys. I don't know. I know where they're coming from, and I know that it fits within Hyperledger, and so I just said, yeah, you should do this, and they say, can we use it as sponsor? I said yes, and. You know, because I did some kind of assessment and I feel like, okay, this is what's expected of a sponsor. I don't have expertise in the project whatsoever. So I would be uncomfortable if now I'm being, you know, asked to do reporting and all that. That's all I'm saying. So I think we I'm, support, I'm, I, I think everybody supports that view, which is that, you know, we put some uh, verbiage in our charter about uh, the, sponsors initial responsibility and then have suggestions on additional responsibilities but now i'm seeing uh, on the chat hard saying that the labs towards role is to enforce the quality of the projects uh, so you know now it's, it's it's become a wider conversation so vipin that's just what i had assumed i don't i mean I don't know if this has ever been codified really well. I don't think we've ever had to, to kick out a labs project, have we? We have prevented labs project from coming online, especially one. Yeah, there was at least one, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, there were multiple. One was uh, the ID, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, project that was brought by uh, the Italian group um, and we and I'm supposed to be the sponsor and we said look you have to follow these rules and then we never heard back from them but we haven't kicked out a project yet that no no has no been. no I in fact I, I think we shouldn't kick out the project because that immediately brings in um, you know lots of different governance uh, um, rules I mean inactivity is one thing but judging the quality of the code and uh, whether it is fit for purpose and whether it can be deployed and all that, I mean, that's a completely different animal. And that, you know, I don't know what Arnold's views on that are, but I don't think the lab stewards should take that on right now anyway. All right, so we're just about done. Uh, we've got about 10 seconds left to our meeting uh, time, so. Um, maybe uh, Arno Vipin, 
uh, we should take this back to the lab stewards with kind of this an additional input and see if we can come up yeah. with some suggested verbiage for uh, what goes into the charter. I agree. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, we'll hold off on the project versus sub project until our next meeting. And uh, again, Explorer and Composer uh, updates should be the next meeting that we have. All right. So, thanks everybody for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Bye bye. Ciao.